so honored today that we have such an esteemed guest as a scientist, a professor, uh, an animal behaviorist, but most passionately for me as an educator, um, Temple Grandin is a spokesperson, an activist, and an ally for those on the autism spectrum. And so throughout this wonderful interview, we're gonna learn um, some personal anecdotes about Temple, but she's also gonna share her life in the field of, of the things that she's been able to do that have truly changed the world. She's about getting things done. So Temple, let's, let's start there. You like to get things done. You don't wanna pontificate. You wanna get things done. And, and where does that, that ability to make change come from? Well, I'm an extreme visual thinker. And I think that might have something to do with it because everything I think about is a picture. So let's just think of something simple like driving to the airport. I always leave an extra hour because I'm visualizing, well, maybe there'll be a traffic jam out on the freeway or something like that. Um, and now I'm seeing this truck that spilled all these boxes all over the freeway. That was an hour tie up. You see, those things are, are not abstract. And, and there's different kinds of thinking. I'm what's called an object visualizer. And I first talked about this in my book, Thinking in Pictures, before I learned exactly what an object visualizer was. Um, it's a person that thinks completely in pictures. And that is how I think. I described that in my book, Thinking in Pictures. And I discovered when I was in my mid-30s that um, most people think more in words they don't think in pictures. Now, when I write, I see the pictures of the things I'm going to write. You've got the object visualizers like me, and then you've got the mathematical pattern thinkers, uh, where they think more in patterns and think music and math. Those are going to be your computer programs. Um, but I like to get things done. I like real stuff that's not abstract. Because what I've learned about verbal thinking, there's a tendency to have an abstract policy or something like that. But they don't think about how do I actually implement that policy? Okay, like having an inclusive classroom. Well, I'm going to see that as specifics. Here's a situation where it worked. Here's a situation where it did not work. What are the common denominators of the situations that really worked? First of all, you've got to have a teacher and a principal that are behind it. I've learned that with my cattle handling work. You've got to have the management of the ranch, the feed yard, the meat plant, whatever it is, has to be behind having and support, having good you know, animal handling practices. Temple, I appreciate how your practical experience is a part of how you process and you learn and ultimately practice. But I'd love for you to talk about those early years. I understand that until you were about three or four years old, you were nonverbal. So can you tell our audience about those early years before you were speaking? I can remember the frustration of not being able to have talk. Very, very frustrating. Did not have full speech till four. And when the grown-ups talked really fast, I just wanted to gibberish. But I got into very good speech therapy by age two and a half. <coughs> the other thing that was done with me when I was um, started to show art ability, as I'm a visual thinker around second and third grade, my mother, my mother always encouraged it. Take the thing the kid's good at, build on it. Another kid, it might be math. Another kid, it might be writing. Those are the kids that love history. See, kids that are on the autism spectrum are often really good at one thing and really bad at something else. That's the way it kind of works. And mother built on my strengths. But I would just draw the same horse head over and over again. And she'd say, well, why don't you draw the stable or draw the saddle or draw the entire horse? You want to broaden it. The other big thing that gets mixed up is the difference between an interest, that'd be dogs or horses or cars, for example, and a skill like drawing, mechanical ability, mathematical ability, music ability. They're two different things, a, an ability and a skill and an interest. You know, the people on the autism spectrum, vehicles are a very common interest, trains, cars, airplanes. So if the child is interested in that, let's read about them. Let's do math with airplanes and take that interest and broaden it. Now this being, I'm also very much an associative thinker. 
And just last week, I went to a great STEM program in Salt Lake City that the state's actually paying for. And I watched an autistic 12 year old come in there and he totally got into it, 3D printing. And it took an hour and a half to print out a little tiny plastic airplane. And he was completely fixated on this, but he also acted a lot less autistic because other people there also had a shared interest in how the 3D printer worked. See, I like um, seeing that kid get involved in it. Now that's a specific example of an activity to help the autistic kid develop because he's got to do the 3D printer with other people there in the maker lab. Temple, what's so well documented is your mother's advocacy. She was an advocate for you in schools before there was even advocates in schools. Uh, and what she fought for was mentorship and teacher accountability and therapists. So can you talk about how important it was for your mother to be your advocate? I was the kind of kid that in the 50s, they used to just put away an institution. But then you have a lot of kids that are autistic where there's no speech to it. That used to be called Asperger's syndrome. Um, geeks and nerds would be the same thing. They have the characteristics of autism, but uh, there's no uh, speech delay. And a lot of granddads have come up to me and told me that they, they're finding out they're autistic when the kids get diagnosed. Now here's another person that's autistic, Elon Musk. Right here, I'm holding Ashley Vance's book about Elon Musk. And I've got some yellow post-it notes that have been in there since the book was published where I marked the pages where I thought Elon Musk was autistic. Now I can say it because it came out on the Saturday Night Live and told everybody. You know, I, I love that you, when you do presentations, you often talk about Elon Musk and Mozart and, and Einstein and people that you believe are on the autism spectrum and this continuum. So let's talk about that. You're in great company. This is the problem with autism. When I was a young child at three, I looked really severe. Now, one thing that was in my favor, I did not have epilepsy. And the first doctor I went to was a neurologist. She tested me for epilepsy. And if you have a child who's not talking, obviously you have to make sure they're not deaf. You've got to rule that out. And I, um, then once that's ruled out, she recommended a speech therapy school that um, where two teachers just did it in their house. And they had, you know, about six uh, kids in a class. And they, there was a lot of emphasis on learning how to wait and take turns. Well, this is one thing that's good about the 3D printer I was watching. Uh, this is kind of a delicate little device that moves its control by the laptop, but um, it's a mechanical device, it's quite delicate, and it requires patience. It takes an hour and 20 minutes to make one little plastic airplane. It's maybe this, you know, maybe four inches long. Um, but the, um, you know, the kid totally got involved in that. I had a wonderful third grade teacher. Then I had my science teacher in high school. And for the first three years I was in high school, um, I didn't do any studying. In fact, I got kicked out of a regular high school for throwing a book at a girl who teased me in ninth grade. Had to go to, to school for kids with problems. They, they had me run the horse barn for three years. Rather expensive school of horse barn management. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I learned from that was I learned how to work. And I'm realizing just how important that was. And then the last year that I was there, Mr. Carlock was, came and he gave me interesting science projects. So now I was motivated to study because studying now is a pathway to a goal. Yeah, that's really important. You know, what I've loved about your work is you always pay an ode to the 50s. It taught you manners. It taught you how to, how to wait your turn. It taught you how to be self-reliant. Your mom made you get internships and, and work over the summer. Uh, yes, I had... We were learning work skills. I mean, we were selling candy for charity uh, around the neighborhood. And when I was about 10. My sister and I had a really uh, catastrophically bad Kool-Aid stand. <laughs> we ran out of sugar and we found out how much sugar was in Kool-Aid. But you learned you better have enough supplies. You know, you learn something from that. And, and in the 50s, kids were taught. And that's why a lot of the granddads ended up having jobs. Manners were taught in a really systematic way. And they used what I call teachable moments. So if I stuck my finger in the mashed potatoes and licked it, uh, mother didn't scream no. She just said, use the fork. Other people think that's disgusting when you do that. She'd calmly tell you what to do. And, and if I went over to the next door neighbor's house, the other mom would do the same thing. 
That's just the way it was done in the fifties. And I think that was helpful. I'm seeing too many kids today, smart kids with a label, never gone shopping. Mm. I was shopping by the time I was seven and eight years old. I also like how you talked about board games, that you have to wait your turn. And now when kids do video games, they're autonomous and alone and, and they're not they're not taking turns. The problem with the video game stuff is these kids are not becoming video game designers. They're just ending up stuck in their basement or the bedroom. Uh, and and there's been three cases where an adult with autism were weaned off of video games successfully with car mechanics. And they found that car mechanics is more interesting than video games. So yes, visual thinkers also are the mechanical people. Now there's just been a big hurricane that smashed all the power poles. They've got hundreds and hundreds of utility workers. Well, some of those utility workers, they have to put the stuff back together. And I've worked with a lot of those kind of people in the meat plants. They're going to be some of your visual thinkers. Don't stick your nose up at skilled trades. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of skill to put all that stuff back together again or to build it in the first place. Temple, I'd, I'd like you to speak about your middle school years. You know, middle school is a tough time for anyone, but sadly you were bullied. And I think that bullying is what led to you throwing the book and eventually getting expelled. So can you tell our audience about those really tough middle school years? A lot of kids are bullied in elementary school. And the, re and the reason I wasn't is Mrs. Teach, he was the head teacher for my little elementary school, a little tiny small school, um, explained to the kids that I had a disability, but it was not visible like crutches or a wheelchair, and that they needed to be helping me, not torturing me. I've now learned that's called peer-mediated intervention. Mm. And I've got a paper online that's titled How Horses Help the Teenager with Autism uh, Make Friends and Learn How to Work. You can look that up online. And I looked, I actually reviewed some of the research on peer-mediated intervention. And that um, helped me. Um, high school was just the worst. And then when I went to the special school, I was still bullied. I was called tape recorder, because I always repeated the same phrases. I was called bones, because I was skinny. And workhorse, another thing I was called. And the only places I was not bullied was shared interests, riding horses, decorating plastic model horses with my roommate, and um, electronics lab and model rocket club. Because the students that participated in those activities were not the bullies. Friends through shared interests. I cannot emphasize that enough. Temple, I'd like for you to talk about your mentor, the esteemed science teacher, Mr. Carlock, who formerly worked at NASA, who really encouraged you to expand on your idea of creating a hug machine. Can you tell us about that influence with that incredible teacher of yours? He encouraged me with that because I watched cattle go in the squeeze chute. And I noticed sometimes cattle calm down and squeak in the squeeze chute to hold them still from getting their vaccinations. And um, he, he suggested that I build it and then also do a little experiment, which um, I did as an undergraduate thesis, which actually finally got written up. I've got a paper on it in a psychiatric journal. So I was really happy to get that, get that actually academically uh, published. Uh, now, one of the things that really holds back a visual thinker like me is it can't do algebra. Absolutely can't. I took a biomedical engineering class. I had to drop it and I was, because I couldn't do the math. But this brings up a really important thing about engineering. There's the industrial design side of engineering. That's me. Uh, and then there's the more mathematical side of engineering. And when I was out working on these great big meat plants, it's very interesting when they build the whole factory right from the ground up, how the labor is divided up on who designs stuff. I had I worked with a lot of people. <coughs> I worked with a lot of people that um, maybe just a high school graduate took a drafting class in high school that owned a metal fabrication shop and have 20 patents. And they do what I call the clever engineering department. The very clever visual things, mechanical things. Then you then you have the parts of the plant that are more abstract: boilers, refrigeration, roof snow loads, things like that. That's done by the engineer the, with a college degree. And, but you still have to have the clever engineering department. And I'm very getting concerned that our education system is screening out a lot of the people like me. And uh, well, they had to get a lot of people like me to put the utilities all back together after the hurricane smashed everything. Um, that's highly skilled work. I'm not talking about just roofing a warehouse. 
That's I love that, I love that you're an advocate for for diversified learning for yes, absolutely first. absolutely and in my book, the autistic brain I present the science that shows that these different kinds of thinking actually really do exist. There's science. And I'm an object visualizer who looks at things in pictures. And then you have the mathematical mind that thinks more in patterns. And there's scientific research now that supports that. And an extreme object visualizer is not going to be also an extreme mathematician. And there's lots and lots of people kind of in the middle. But we need the different kinds of minds. One of the reasons why Zoom took over was easy to use. That's the interface. A more mathematical mind has to program it. Temple, what I find fascinating is how you have identified that you are a visual learner. And you often refer to your brain as your individual Google. As you're searching for data, you search for these photos and these images, these visual images in your brain. So can you tell our audience about what it means to be a visual learner? I'm much more of a bottom-up thinker where a highly verbal thinker will have an abstract policy, but no idea how to implement it. But to make a bottom-up thinker good at thinking, I have to have lots of experiences. You gotta get out and experience lots of stuff to fill the database. That's why I read a whole lot of stuff. I've traveled a great deal. And when I got to be about 40, that's when I thought, boy, I can really think really good now because I filled the database. And I've had parents tell me that when they got their kid off the couch and got them out um, doing a job, they said, well, he just blossomed mm -hmm. because you see you're filling the database. Well, you were a million mile, mile flyer. You've written nearly 10 books. I think you have nine books, 60 articles published in academic journals. So you're, you've definitely seen the world. I've been in all of Western Europe. I've been to a good parts of South America, Canada. I've um, been to a lot of different countries, um, China, Asia, Japan, Philippines. Um, travel's a great educator. Can we talk about, you, you, you said something earlier that just made me very sad. And, I, and I'm, you know, you're, I know that when you were born and, and in that early age of, of not being verbal, that an option at that time was to institutionalize children. Well, the thing that was bad in the 50s is that the kids that didn't know how to talk, they usually just institutionalized, and the more Asperger type of kids, uh, they, they usually ended up getting jobs. Now, where they had problems was in their relationships. And I've got another book called Different Not Lessons, 18 people telling about their lives um, uh, when they got diagnosed later in life because of relationship were a mess. And that's where the diagnosis helped them. But today, I'm seeing too many kids held back, smart kids that have uh, never gone grocery shopping. This is ridiculous. They have learned, you know, aren't taught how to use a bank account, just basic stuff like that. Can we talk about relationships then? I, I know that sometimes on the autism spectrum, that, that social interaction could be difficult or a struggle. And, and was it like that for you? Well, I can share interests. I get down and we sit down and talk, talk about how we're going to build something. That, um, that's really fun. I have problems with some of the chit chat. And part of the reason is I can't follow it. I don't think that um, fast. I, I don't just shift attention quickly. And there's kind of a rhythm of conversation I still can't do. People say, well, Temple interrupts during interviews. I know I do that. And part of the problem is I can't get the timing right. Because if, I'm a, if I was a computer, I'm only an Intel 286 with a really small working memory, but I've got the cloud for graphic story. <laughs> Interrupt away. Um, what you have to say is far more important than me. But they, they um, and then we got to be careful on the first job with multitasking. Don't put them on some crazy busy takeout window. Temple, as, as a teacher, I really appreciate how candid and honest you've been about your own personal overload when, when you have that that sensory overload it often can make you feel that you're shutting down and so a lot of young people who are on the autism spectrum also have that same sensory overload so can you tell the audience specifically teachers maybe some signs that we can look out for these sensory issues vary a whole lot and uh, loud noises hurt my ears 
I didn't like balloons when I was a child because you never know when they're going to pop. Now, one of the ways to help with the sound sensitivity is to let the child control the thing that makes the noise. Like uh, there were some kids that would, in high school, be really good building things in shop, but they couldn't stand the sound of some of the tools. Well, the thing is to do is let them go down at the shop and turn the electric grill on and off and nobody's there. Or the buzzer on the scoreboard, they hate that. We'll go down when nobody's there in the gym and they can turn the buzzer on and off. Or the hairdryer on and off. Whatever the thing is where they control it. But there's some people that need sensory breaks. Another big problem I had was anxiety. And that was horrible through my 20s. I've been on medication for 40 years. And I described that in detail in my book, uh, Thinking in Pictures. I have a whole chapter on it. And I, if you were interested in my, my experience with medication, I strongly recommend reading the book because I do not want any misunderstandings about medication. But I question whether I would have been as successful if I had not taken it because I found out later on that my fear center was three times bigger than normal. And, and what the medication did is it, it calmed down my fear circuits. That's what it did. You know, and I, I appreciate you talking about medication. You know, a lot of our parents, educators, teachers um, may also be on medication. And, and you've always been an advocate in, in moderation to be conservative, but that it lessened your anxiety. You, you, you said you used to be, sit in a room and, and be so fearful. Well, I'd be so fearful. Like I was just paralyzed. And and I'd, way too many meds are given out to little kids, way too much. But then I know other people, especially visual thinkers like me, where a little bit of Prozac uh, has made all the difference in the world. And one of the mistakes that's made with antidepressants is taking too high a dose. And then you get agitation and insomnia. That's a complete mess. Um, but I, I uh, did the dip bat projects that were so new before I had meds. But then I don't know, uh, uh, my health was getting worse and worse and worse because of a constant anxiety. And then I went on a little dose of antidepressant and it like throttled back my nervous system. Instead of going 200 miles an hour, I would now vary from 55 miles an hour to maybe hundred miles an hour. Instead of hundred miles an hour to 200 miles an hour. Okay, I'm sorry, I should have used some metric measurements, but <laughs> it, it, um, I, it like throttled down my extreme fear and started response. In fact, in the, in the book, I said it's like adjusting the idle screw on an old fashioned carburetor. There's not many people in the world that can say that Claire Dane played them. What an Emmy, uh, your, the film that is about your life, Dimple Grandin, was nominated for 15 Emmys, won seven, and was a, a window into people's homes and lives and conversations. And what was it like for you to suddenly be in people's homes, at their dinner tables, and implementing educational reform in schools? Well, I figure it's a responsibility. Now, that's the way I look at it. Claire Danes kind of became me. Um, the movie shows visual thinking completely accurately. Also shows all the projects I did uh, really accurately. Um, and I'm, I'm a person who likes to get things done. And people ask me, what can we do to help with fixing schools? One thing they need to be doing is put all the hands-on classes back in. Cooking, sewing, woodworking, art, theater, music. I mean, I was exposed to a little flute when I was a child. I could never figure out how to play it. But you give that to some other kid, and they're going to take off with it and do really great. Get the mechanical classes back into high school, shop and welding. I worked with two people that definitely would be labeled autistic today. They were saved by a single welding class in high school. And one of them owns a very large metal fabrication company, and he sells his stuff all over the world. And that was one welding class that that got him started in his career. Now, for somebody else, that would not be the thing. You see, what I'm, what I'm proposing is they get exposed to enough different things, figure out what they love, but also figure out, well, no, I don't really don't like doing this. I actually hated cooking quite a lot. Speaking of being exposed, your, your mother had the insight to give you two choices. You could go for a week or a summer to visit your aunt in Arizona who owned a ranch. And, and let's talk about that. That's how I ended up in the cattle industry. Hadn't gone to my aunt's ranch, so I probably wouldn't be in the cattle industry. 
actually another thing that was an advantage in the cattle industry is you can do engineering without an engineering degree. I always just called myself a livestock consultant. I did done lots of engineering, lots of steel and concrete work, um, and some mechanical stuff. Um, and and in the in the meat industry, there were people just working on maintenance, and they were designing whole entire plants. And their, their title might be draftsman, but they were doing a lot more than just doing the drafting. I can tell you that. That'd be a single CAD course at a community college, and this guy was designing entire factories. I worked with them. But you came up with this great cliche. You said nature is cruel, but we don't have to be. So well, that's right. I mean, when the hyenas like rip your guts out, um, eat on you while you're still alive, that is not very nice. Yeah, you know, we don't have to be doing that kind of stuff. You know, so we've you got know- to give the animals that we um, use food a decent life. I was just actually on a very big um, animal welfare Zoom conference for the last day and a half with Tyson. And there's an animal welfare guideline called the five domains. Uh, well, you have things like nutrition and health and behavior. Uh, but one of the things that's in that is the animal needs to have some positive emotions and have a life worth living. And I worked on developing um, scoring systems for meat plants, very simple ways of scoring them uh, to measure things like um, you know use of electric prods, animals falling down. Um, it's real simple metrics that uh, prevent some of, you know, prevent abuse from happening. What I love about what you've been able to do is you have great empathy and compassion for the animals um, because you, you believe that they too are visual thinkers. Animals are sensory-based thinkers. In fact, my student, Megan Corrigan, just finished up a really interesting study, the horse, to show that when horses get afraid of things, it, it's a visual thinking. Uh, she took a plastic Playset, set, a very colorful play set that had a slide and a swing for toddler. You know, it was, uh, you know, like four foot by four foot or just slightly a, a meter, meter and a half by a meter and a half, not that big, fit on a pallet. That's internationally the same. And, and think about the slide on the play set. If I hold this stapler this way, it looks different than this way. Okay the slide on the place that's gonna look different. So she set it up in an alcove in the, in the stable and walked at young uh, horror broken uh, colts and fillies by it um, 15 times. Now everything was done at a walk because we didn't want any horses really getting scared. And she looked at, uh, well, did they put their head up? Did they blow their nostrils out a little bit? Did they stop? And when they first saw it, they would do that. And then they would habituate. So now you've got Colts and Phillies totally habituated to this little plastic play set. Now you rotate it 90 degrees, it became something new. Now, if you've been galloping your horse, that would have, could have been a serious accident. That play set became a new thing when you turned it because it looked different. It looked really different. We would just go, yeah, that's kid's toy. You know, we got a bigger cortex and the horses got it. But that shows right there that a horse is a visual thinker, and it would explain some of the spooking and bucking people off that seems to happen for no reason. But I think with your the way you process and your sensitivity, you ultimately had empathy for for cows who were scared. If there was a flag that was waving, or if there was a piece of a fence that was teetering, I noticed they'd stop at a shed. They'd stop. There was a coat hanging over the side of a chute. Other people hadn't noticed that. Because if you think in words, you might have a hard time imagining how an animal could even have a thought. They didn't think in words. You know, and there's actually still some big discussions about animal consciousness. Well, when you think in pictures, I don't think in words. It's obvious to me, the animal thinks. It also was obvious to me to look at what cattle were looking at. And something as simple as taking the coat off the fence solves the problem. Now, let's say I have a dairy cow and she walks into the milking parlor every day and there's a coat on and she'll get used to that. But the new heifer that goes in the first time, she's going to stop that. When you started working in an industry that was probably more male-dominated on these ranches and working with livestock, do you feel that you were embraced um, with your new methodology and the way that you were bringing sensitivity to this industry? Well... Uh, being a woman was the biggest barrier in the 70s, the early 70s. Um, and most of the trouble ahead was at the middle management and the foreman level. It was not the owner of the feed yard or the big boss. 
It was his middle management people that felt threatened. That's what almost all the trouble was. The other thing that I learned to do was to sell my work. So I would show drawings to people. I'd show pictures to people. I'd show people off what my work was like. In fact, here are some drawings that I have that are in my book, Thinking in Pictures. Wow. And this book's been through a few Zoom calls so the pages started to fall out. Um, but I learned to sell my work rather than myself. And I've been having a lot of discussions with employers. So I said, we need to get rid of the regular interview. Stop to the people with autism don't do well with that. And just have them come in and show all of, give them a programming project and let's see how they do. They're a math person. Or if there's someone like me, give me an industrial design project and see how I do with it. What I also love is you've asked us to look at language. You know, I think oftentimes the word disability, um, disabled, starts in such, and as an English teacher, it's difficult for me to take those, those negative words. And you promote diversity in, 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 in the way that people process. If you didn't have visual thinkers, you never get the power back on. And all that stuff's been trashed, all these big poles, big high line poles smashed over. Um, and I'm getting concerned about who's going to be the young line men coming in. It's a two year community college degree. And I'm just seeing kids getting screened out with the algebra requirement. And you do need a certain amount of mathematics, but you don't need abstract algebra that you don't need, unless you're actually designing power grids. That's for the math heads. That's not for me. As a fellow million mile flyer, um, you and I zigzag the country and I often have spoken in school districts where you had just been and you are making education better. So what are some of the things that you like to leave as a takeaway? Because I know you're realist and pragmatic. What do you want schools to do better? Putting all the, all the hands-on classes back in because some of these kids that are different, that's where they excel. Art class, music class, um, you know, welding. Some really like cooking. Um, theater. Now, I wasn't interested in acting in the play, but I've made... I made sets and costumes for every single uh, elementary school, high school, and college. But that's something that can turn into a career. I also love that you fight fiercely to get rid of stigmas and stereotypes and shame. Um, I really like the Paralympics and the fact that it's in the same venues and everything because you're showing what people can do. I don't like all these disabilities being lumped together because um, the kind of um, problems I have are very different than a blind person or somebody in a wheelchair. You see, I don't think about it in words. I mean, I see a wheelchair when I see it. In fact, I saw a wheelchair the other day. I was hooked up to one of those little scooters. I'm going really fast. What was it like for you when you when you si suddenly had a diagnosis? Um, and I know it didn't come till years later. Did did that help or hurt? And and what does a diagnosis mean to you and and ultimately to others? Well, I'm concerned with the work side of things. The diagnosis holding them back. I'm seeing a lot of parents that can't let go. They don't think their kid can learn to drive. They don't think their kid can learn to hold a job or even shop at the supermarket. Um, but where a diagnosis helps is the older person with relationships. That's where it's helpful. Let's discuss driving. I got this little prop right here. You can thank our local farm credit union. Just this year, gave out these cute little trucks. And this is what I learned to drive on. It's an exact replica of it. It had three on the tree, a horrible clutch. <laughs> and I started in the horse paint. It's going to take longer. You're going to have to spend a lot more time learning to drive the vehicle until you touch traffic. I did horse pasture. For, you know, several hours, and then we started driving to my aunt's mailbox, which would be three miles or six kilometers from the ranch. So that was 20 minutes driving every day on a dirt road in a really safe place. This is where you got to start big parking lots. Oh, the deserted office parks, those are good places to practice. Um, if you're in Texas, the oil field roads, great place to practice. And you start out in, in big fields and deserted parking lots, places that are completely safe. And it's going to take longer. And sometimes in the driver's ed programs, they shove them into it way too quickly. It's going to take a lot more time practicing driving. So that the, you see, for me, the clutch and the gear shift had to get on autopilot before I touched traffic. That's called motor memory. 
But if I hadn't learned to drive, that would have really limited my work in the livestock industry. But I believe you, you're such a proponent of agency and independence. And I love that you fight for others to have agency. And just learning basic skills. I'm realizing now that the 50s tradition of giving a kid allowance, and I got 50 cents a week, that bought about $5 worth of stuff. And mother had certain items that were allowance items. It's pretty standard in our neighborhood. And I could buy five comics or I could get 10 candy bars. But if I wanted a 69 cent balsa wood airplane with a propeller, I had to save for two weeks. And I'm realizing the important things that, that taught. Another thing they did in my neighborhood about the same age is that when the parents had a party, you had to dress up in your best clothes and greet the guests and pass out the snacks and learn how to talk to the guests. That taught social uh, social skills. And, and if you didn't, you forgot to say please or thank you, a mother would cue me, you forgot to say. And, and I'm realizing how important that was. And a lot of the grandfathers I've talked to who've been employed also um, they said it was really important. And they learned to work by having paper routes at age 11. So we've got to find jo volunteer jobs to replace that childhood paper route, like maybe volunteering at a church, volunteering at a farmer's market or some neighborhood community center. I love that. When, when we think about the, the squeeze shoot and how that became your high school science project with your hug machine, can you talk about why folks on the autism spectrum often need that, that intimacy? It's just deep pressure. And, and okay, a lot of people say, well, I go to the dentist and they put that heavy apron on you for the x-rays. A lot of people kind of like that apron. Mm -hmm. That's just an example of deep pressure. And, and there are some people that have autism that, um, or, or, or that really like that, um, that pressure. And there's others that don't. See, this is where sensory things are very, very variable. Also, by using the squeeze machine, which I could control. See, that's another important thing. Then I got to where I could tolerate hug, people hugging me. And now I, I understand that your machine broke. In that interim between the, the machine breaking and COVID and, and being vaccinated, to hug, what was that like? Did you miss that deep pressure? Yeah, I'm hugging a few people now that I'm fully vaccinated. Uh, one thing that's helped me during COVID, I really recommend this. When the lockdown was, get up every morning, shower to dress to work by seven every morning. And I'd let the showers beat on my face and I'd feel a lot better when I got out. It made a difference. Mm. In other words, don't just lounge around in your jammies. When you talked about your peer mediation in elementary school, um, what I have learned is some of the best learning I have learned as an educator is with relationships with people who are on the spectrum. I want, I want to tell you about two specifically, and I'd love for you to give them some advice. Um, okay. One is a exquisite gentleman. He just graduated. Okay, um, well, the first one, his name is Jaden. Um, he is a freedom writer, author, ambassador, and he just graduated from high school. Okay. And Jaden uh, was taken from his class and put often in a resource. And it led to teasing and bullying. And he he didn't understand what his diagnosis was. He called it ass, A-S-S, -S, like ass, Burgers, like the, the burgers you eat at McDonald's. Well, so yeah, he called yeah. Asperger's Asperger's, which I thought was delightful. Um, yeah. okay. And now that he's on the other side of school, um, what I love that he's become is an advocate for not making kids feel different and be different. So if if you could tell Jaden, um, who's now just beginning his academic career in higher education, what would be a recommendation for someone who has Asperger's? I'll make a recommendation. I tell every student, every student, doesn't matter what, whether they have autism or they're autistic or whatever. Uh, if you get in trouble in a class, let's say you fail a quiz, do something about it right away. Like get tutoring or something. Always have flunked the class or fail the class. I realize we're talking to other countries. You might not know what flunk meant. Um, and and uh, the other thing is do lots of different things, different internships, uh, get involved with a lot of different activities, things that can lead to jobs. I can't emphasize that enough. Well, just uh, 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 help with the research, professor's research. You can look at their publications. So they'll usually be published on the departmental webpage and get involved in a lot of those things. 
so you can start doing things that will lead to a job. I think there needs to be a gradual transition from the world of school to the world of work. And I've got students that are in the pipeline right now I recommend two real jobs before they graduate from high school. And one of the big problems I'm seeing for autistic kids is that differentiation is not being made where a simple job like maybe pushing carts in the grocery store is a training job. That's a training job for me. And for some other individual, it might be a suitable career. And that distinction is not being made. But learning the work skills, I'd recommend it in the summer that he um, get some jobs. Because what you don't want to have is a sudden transition that you get where you're out of school, now what do I do? That's great. So getting work experience while he's in co college. The other thing is you'll be a much better advocate if you can tell other students um, how, you met, how you got a job at an office supply store. That was one that was real successful, quiet, and got recognized for knowledge of every printer that was in the place. Um, but getting those kind of experiences before you graduate, I can't emphasize that enough. Um, trying lots of different things. I've just got a new graduate student in and she, we had lunch today and we talked about some of the things she wanted to do and I strongly recommended, um, you know, talk to Terry, who's one of our other professors, about some of the research that's going on at, at the experiment station and get involved with helping them work out. Get involved with the horse experiments or you know, horse research or whatever. Get involved in a whole bunch of different things and you're gonna see what you like. You're also gonna go, yeah, I hate that. I never wanna do it. It's also important to find that out too. The other question I have for you is a Freedom Rider teacher. Her name is Carol Ann. And when I met her and I discovered that she also is on the autism spectrum, I invited her to a teacher training and she said, I can't come, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a teacher. And I said, Carol Ann, you very much are because you're gonna come to this training and teach us about the autism spectrum. So for those that are not in school, they're parents, they're adults, what can they give to society? I had some problems. I had another good mentor, his name was Jim Uhl. He was a former Marine Corps captain starting a small steel and concrete business to build cattle handling facilities. And he seeked me out. And he was another very important mentor. And I had a problem on one job, the customer wasn't satisfied. And he says, no, you don't give up. You just got to keep on going. He was another super important mentor. And there was another former army officer um, that was the superintendent of the local Swift meatpacking plant. He was another person who was extremely helpful. And, and um, it's interesting, they were both former military officers. You know, there's sort of a no-nonsense, get-it-done mentality that they have that I seem to resonate with. Most people really helped me. You never know where you're going to find, find mentors, but Jim was attracted to me because he'd seen my drawings, and he needed somebody to design projects for him to build. Mm. And we made, for 10 years, we built jobs together. And then I went away to Illinois, and the, the cattle industry got less in Arizona, and he went off and did commercial construction stuff. Well, as a former time 100 person of the year, you were in the heroes category. I'd like you to give advice to the four-year-old Temple who was learning to speak, was going to go to school shortly. Um, what advice would Temple now with her PhD and her books and her advocacy, tell a four-year-old Temple if you were a four-year-old Temple's mentor? Well, I want to get them out doing things. And that's why I did books like The Outdoor Scientist, where I described the rock collection my sister and I had. I'm, you know, observing animal behavior. I have another book, Calling All Minds, when I was about six. I was making little bird kites and parachutes and tinkering and tinkering. Let's get that kid out there doing things. We got kids today that are growing up that have never used a tool. They aren't doing enough just um, hands-on on stuff. And I went to Maker Fair about five years ago, and the big hit there was large cardboard boxes that things like washing machines and refrigerators came in, and the kids were making stuff out of them. Yeah, what are those boxes? You can get them for free. I'm, I've also talked to a lot of low-income folks, so I'm always looking for things that they can do that don't, don't cost a lot of money, um, where they can get kids just making stuff. You know, find a retired mechanic and 
teach him how to fix lawnmowers. So I wouldn't do that with a four-year-old, but uh, <laughs> how can a kid find out he likes mechanics if they're never exposed to mechanical things? You see, this whole thing of exposure to careers is really, really important. I did a whole, I uh, looked up Michelangelo, and I think he was a, a autistic. And one, two things helped him. He was exposed to the art. Every church was commissioning all this art, and he'd be walking around looking at that. He also grew up in a family that were stone cutters, so he got introduced to the tools at an early age. What, what advice would Temple Grandin now give to the 14-year-old girl that you threw the book at? Because clearly she was insecure and bullying you, but what, what advice would you give her now? I don't know. The people that bullied me uh, have never reconnected with me. They Now, a lot of other people from elementary school, high school, that I was friends with, I have reconnected with some of those. But the people that were the big bullies, they've never come up to me and reconnect, made any attempt to reconnect. And if they did, what, what would you say to them? I don't know. I'd be interested in one girl who bullied me. I found out became a counselor. Uh, but I found that out from somebody else. Um, and the other ones, I don't know where they're at. Sadly, Temple, as someone on the autism spectrum, you were bullied in school and often sent away. And what makes me really disheartened is that teachers, administrators, and even principals did not intervene or advocate on your behalf. Luckily, your mother did. So for parents out there, what could they learn from these lessons when a parent is an advocate? They, um, like my mother has a book and, and she's really mad at that school for, you know, not handling things better. Now, fortunately at the time, mother was uh, working as a journalist uh, looking at special schools. So she'd been, in, been to a whole bunch of special schools as a journalism um, project doing a TV show for NPR. And um, she picked out three schools she let me choose. Mother always believed in giving some choices. And, and um, the school I went to had a farm. And they did lots of hands-on things. They had horses to ride. And, and that, was, that, that was really helpful. But there was bullying going on there, especially in the cafeteria. And when I walked across the parking lot, they'd be yelling, tape recorder. Mm. And I didn't know at the time why they were calling me that. And they were calling me tape recorder because... Um, I've always kept using the same phrases. Temple, you mentioned that a lot of people on the autism spectrum often fixate. And you talk about taking that fixation and broadening horizons and doing something good both professionally, personally, and academically. So can you elaborate about the importance of using fixation for good? Okay, let's say I talk, already discussed the difference between an interest or a fixation that might be cars or something like that, from a skill which might be mechanics, visual thinking, mathematics, and those skills need to be developed. And you can often use the thing that the child's interested in as the vehicle for for teaching something like reading. I didn't read until I was eight years old. The first thing was to start with a book worth reading, and mother taught me with phonics. Another kid might be sight words. Some kids are sight words, some are phonics. You know, use, use the method that, uh, that works. What you want to do is take that fixation and broaden it. So let's say for me, it was just doing a single horse head over and over again. Well, mother said, well, let's draw the stable. Uh, let's uh, let's uh, talk about a place you might ride a horse to. You see how I'm making an associative link back to the horse but I'm broadening it. I mean, you want to broaden it so it's less fixated. Temple, I appreciate how you pay homage to your mother. She found the perfect mentors for you, the perfect therapist for you. She sent you to the ranch to embolden you in your life's work. And so tell us a little bit more about the advocacy that your mother played in your development. She also realized that I needed to keep on moving and develop. See, what, one problem I'm seeing with a lot of parents is they can't let go. When I suggest that their kid buy something in a store, one mom said she couldn't let go. And I was just talking about going to the store and buy some printer paper. 
and she broke down and said, well, I can't let go. She's 16 years old, in good grades in school, and uh, she's crying over printer paper. She knew, she was always stretching me to do new things, not throwing me in the deep end of the pool, but um, she was instrumental in getting Ann out at the ranch to teach me driving. So she decided that that was something I needed to get done by the end of the summer. That was mother's idea to do that. Um, it was very lucky the mailbox was three miles or six kilometers away, because that was just the perfect practice. It took exactly 20 minutes to go up and back to that mailbox. If that mailbox had been a quarter of a mile away, uh, half a kilometer, I wouldn't have gotten as much driving practice. We had to pick the mail up anyway. But that, um, um, she had a very good sense of how to stretch me and get me out exposed to new things. Because as a bottom up thinker, in order to have a lot of knowledge, I got to see a lot of stuff to put information into my database that's in my brain. Mm. I have to read things, I have to see things, I have to do things to do that. Well, I think for our audience, um, we live in a world where there's a lot of bottom up thinkers. There's a lot of people who are on the spectrum and this continuum. So for my last question is for our audience, whether they are a student, a parent, an educator, or just a citizen of the world, what is your advice for us to be inclusive and accepting of anyone who thinks differently than ourselves? First of all, you have to be aware that different thinking exists. When I was in my 20s, I thought everybody thought pictures the way I did. I didn't know that verbal thinking even existed. So the first step is realizing that different kinds of thinking exist. And I've said the same thing to like corporate managers. Um, and some people are very, very highly verbal, very top down in their thinking. People like me, it's it, concepts are learned by specific example. And then I put the pictures into categories. Also the mathematicians tend to be more bottom up thinkers. Um, but, and these skills can complement each other. They can be complementary skills. Okay, right now I'm working on a book on visual thinking with my super verbal, super good co-author, Betsy Lerner. And the way Betsy rearranges my stuff, it's absolutely wonderful. But she couldn't get stuff, make up some of the stuff I do or find <laughs> some of the stuff I do. Uh, when it comes to finding things online, I'm an extremely good surfer. And when I teach students how to surf online, I said, you gotta remember, let's say we're looking at some cattle stuff. There's six different words for cattle. You might have to do six different searches. You've got cow, bull, steer, heifer, calf, and calves. You might want to do, don't blob it all together. Do a separate search for each one. Let's say you want to look at grazing behavior. It might be cows and grazing behavior, steers and grazing behavior, cattle and grazing behavior. Three different searches. And you'll get some papers that overlap, but you'll also get some different new ones. Temple, as a fellow educator, I love encouraging our audience to do a homework assignment at the end of our podcast. So my homework assignment today is simple. I want them to learn about you and more about the autism spectrum. To do so, they can watch the incredible Emmy award-winning film about you, or they can pick up one of your books. You are a voracious writer and scientists. So can you tell us about some of the books that you could encourage our audience to pick up and read? Thinking in Pictures is my autobiography and I just did a new afterword in it. And it has some of my ideas of education. Then I've got The Way I See It. This book is a lot of little short chapters and really great for teachers working with the younger kids. So those two are my you know, really important uh, autism books. And then I also have lots of livestock and animal behavior books. And I already talked about the outdoor scientist and calling all minds because we need to get kids out doing things. We've got kids today growing up today. They're afraid to make a mistake. I had a teacher ask me, I just couldn't believe it. The teacher asked me this. One of the projects is just a simple snowflake. I had a teacher ask me, what would happen to a kid's self-esteem? They cut it wrong and the snowflake fell apart. I said, you get another piece of paper and you just try again. And then if that doesn't work, you can look it up on YouTube. I'm sure you'll find directions there. You learn from your mistakes. But we, I think we have some teachers now growing up in such a verbal world that they're worried about a kid's self-esteem over a paper snowflake that fell apart. I, 
and this was within the last year I was asked this. This is recent. This is now I got asked that. Well, we're gonna we're gonna allow our audience to fail forward, to take risks, and to not be as fragile as that paper snowflake. Temple, you have just been exquisite. I can't wait to read more, to learn more, and I thank you for enlightening our audience. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's been absolutely wonderful uh, talking to everybody. And um, I just want to see um, kids that are different just get out there and be what they can be. And um, you know, we need all the different kinds of minds and they have complementary skills when they work together.